Hi, good afternoon. How's everybody doing today? My name is Jalanis Villaman. I'm an outreach coordinator in the Community Engagement Division at the Office of the Attorney General, Mara Haley. I'm Tim Dad, and I'm also in the Community Engagement Division. We are extremely happy to be here today to speak about the everyday scams and identity theft presentation and training that we'll be doing today. Before we start, we're going to be doing an AGO 101, which is an overview of our agency, what we do and how we can serve you as a community. And then afterwards, my colleague Tim Deppen will be speaking to you about the different type of methods of scams, as well as the resources that we offer in our agency. First, you're going to wonder, have you ever heard who is the Attorney General? That's great. Have you ever seek any services in our office? No? Okay. That is even better too because after this presentation, you can see the different type of resources we can offer you as a resident of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. But before we start, the Attorney General is Mara Healy. She is the Chief Lawyer and Law Enforcement Officer of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. In 2015, when the Attorney General was running for office to be elected, in this position, she noticed that a lot of community, just like today, didn't know about the resources that we offered and didn't know about what we did. So she created my division, which is the Community Engagement Division, so we can give a lot of preventing trainings and the different information resources. How and who we serve? We serve everybody, every single resident in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and their interests. We also represent every single state department, officers, and commission. So if the Department of Transitional Assistance will be the people's law firm, the law firm that will represent that department. We also represent group of consumers. We don't represent individually. We initiate different initiatives through different collaborations to make sure that we serve people individually. We have a mediation program, and we also have a wage theft clinic as well that we have initiated so we can serve people individually with the collaboration of different legal aid agencies in Boston. How? We serve in four ways. We do investigation work. We also do enforcement. As of right now, everybody knows that the minimum wage in the state of Massachusetts is $11. So if the employer is not abiding by the law, we make sure that every single law in the state of Massachusetts is being enforced. We also do prevention work. So that's a lot of the different work that we do in my department itself. We travel statewide, giving a lot of different prevention work, specifically in this type of training that we're going to be hearing today on scams. But we always do all the trainings as well on landlord and tenant rights, for example, workers' rights, and other different type of issues as well. We also do policy work. We have a division that works with legislators on different type of policies, but these are the four different ways we work to execute in our office. How we are organized. We're organized as a six bureaus. During the executive bureau, this is where my division is located, but we also have five other different bureaus. We have the criminal bureau that does a lot of the different investigation work. We have the Healthcare and Fair Competition Bureau. We also have the Energy and Environment. If you follow my boss on either Facebook or any type of social media or have written uh, the different type of press release that we have released in our office, you can see that this year we sue Eversource. So we want, we want to make sure that every single person in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and the interests are being served and well represented. We also have a government department, and that um, government department, they do a lot of this trial. So every time the state is being sued, we're the law, that law firm that is representing. We also do the Public and Protection Advocacy Bureau, and I do want to talk a little bit about this um, bureau specifically later in this presentation because that bureau itself works face-to-face -face with consumers. So right now you have two different types of flyers with you. One of the flyers is the different hotlines that you can call. We have different, different divisions, either Medicaid fraud, we have a hotline for that, we have a hotline for civil rights, we have a hotline for student loans, we have a major hotline for consumer advocacy and response division that we have um, consumer specialists 
that can assist you with any type of issue that you may be having with a vendor or anything, and you want to file a complaint. But majority, that Public Protection and Advocacy Bureau will do majority of that work. Where are we located? And I know some of you asked me at the beginning where we are located. As a statewide agency, we're located in four different regions in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. At headquarters, it's at one Ashburton place in Boston. But as you can see, we have two different offices, which is the 100 Cambridge Street. And this is very important because at 100 Cambridge Street is where the Public Protection and Advocacy Bureau is located where they do more the face-to-face -face, um, issues with clients and they have more face-to-face -face with different type of clients who file complaints. So that's our second office. But we're also located in the central part of Massachusetts, which is in Worcester. We're located in the western part of Massachusetts, which is in Springfield. And lastly, we're located in the southern part of Massachusetts, which is New Bedford. So we want to make sure that as a statewide agency, we're serving each and every one of you in every single region where you where you're, can get the assistance and you don't have to travel all the way to Boston as well. With the Public Protection and Advocacy Bureau, this is very important, as I said before, they have the more face-to-face -face with clients and a lot of the different um, hotlines that you have in front of you with the flyer, you can call, but they will be the one that direct most of those calls. Within that division, we have the Consumer Protection, the Fair Labor that deals with a lot of the workers' issues, the Insurance and Financial Services, we also have the Civil Rights Division, and the Consumer Advocacy and Response Division. And it's very important because the Consumer Advocacy and Response Division deals with majority of the calls from consumers and their complaint as well. Right now, my colleague is gonna be talking about the uh, scams and ID theft. He is our project manager in the same division that I work under, which is the Community, um, community Engagement um, Division. Thank you. Great. All right. So thanks again, everyone, for, for having us out here today. Uh, specifically here to talk today about scams, financial fraud, identity theft. Before we get into the presentation, I do just want to give uh, one, I guess I'll say a warning before we get into it. There was a time at our office uh, when our PowerPoint presentations were written by lawyers and they looked like they were written by lawyers, right? It was a lot of text on every slide. And so uh, we very consciously tried to get away from that. We wanted more pictures. We wanted, you know, some more colors on, on the slides, things like this. I think this is an example of a slide where perhaps we got the balance correct. There are slides coming up where we went too far in the other direction, and I, I think you'll recognize those when we get to them. But I will do my best uh, to explain everything that's on the slides. And if at any point you have a question uh, or something needs clarification, um, you know, please feel free to let me know, and, and I'll do my best to stop right there uh, and explain it to the best of my ability. So scams, identity theft, you know, how are they related at sort of the most base level? A scam is trying to do one of two things, right? It's either trying to get your money right away. That's sort of the short con example here. They get your money, uh, they scam you, you send them your money, and then they're kind of done with you, right? I mean, they may try to scam you again because they got you to send them money the first time, but once they have your money, the, the sort of the worst is over. That, that's the worst thing that can happen, you losing your money. There are also the scams that are going after your personal information, right? A example is some of the information here on your driver's license or things like your social security number, uh, bank account information, things like that. You know, that in and of itself doesn't get the scam or anything. They don't get money. That's not what they're looking for. What they want to do is use that information to steal your identity. And then once they've done that, you know, to, to profit from having stolen your identity. So that's sort of the long con here. Uh, and when you're a victim of a scam or you're the victim of a data breach, right, that gets your personal information into a hacker, into a scammer's hands, it's not over once you recognize it, right? You have to take steps uh, to protect yourself, and we'll go over some of those uh, as the presentation continues. So some general rules to be aware of. I mean, a golden rule, it's pretty simple, but if something sounds too good to be true, it probably is, right? Unfortunately, we don't all just wake up and win the lottery every morning, right? Lotteries we haven't even entered. Uh, I like to add one uh, little corollary to that, which is sometimes if something sounds too bad to be true, we also want to apply a, a certain level of skepticism to it. I don't want to apply my thought process onto everybody here, but 
you know, if someone called me and said that I had won the lottery, there's no way that I would believe them. If somebody called me and said I owed $5,000 on a delinquent student loan, well, I would, you know, I would think maybe something that bad could happen to me. Uh, but we still want to apply the same level of skepticism when someone calls us out of the blue, unsolicited, and says we've won something or we owe money. Uh, some general tips we have here as well. These are, you know, not just specifically for scams, but all sort of consumer interactions. Uh, to read the small print, you know, guard your personal information carefully and research well before you agree to do uh, anything, again, to any business relationship uh, with an organization. So this is one of the examples of the pages I mentioned earlier where we may have gone a little too far in the direction of pictures, but uh, I do think that they, they, um, they're good to, to explain some of the points we're trying to get. Our friend here uh, in the upper, your left-hand corner, what he's there to represent are what are called phishing scams, right? He is a fish with an F, but we're talking about phishing with a PH. That is when a scammer uh, impersonates someone you do business with or may do business with, right? Uh, and tries to get your personal information. They act like they already have it. A good example of this, you get an email from Bank of America. It says you need to update your account number and password. You need to log into your online banking, right? They're acting like it's on you to do it. You have to give them the information so they can make sure it's you. But in reality, they don't have that information already, right? If something is coming in unsolicited to you, you really want to be very careful about ever providing things like bank account numbers, social security numbers, anything like that, uh, unless you know exactly who you're dealing with and you've initiated the, the conversation. Uh, as we go clockwise here, you'll see things like pyramid schemes are slightly different, right? They're not necessarily just an outright scam where someone's trying to steal your money, but you know how they work is you buy into this product, you get a ton of it, and you have to find five or 10 people to buy from you, right? Next thing you know, you'll be a millionaire when they find five or 10 people, right? Uh, what we see most often with those is we'll get calls of people who now have a garage full of whatever product they were supposed to sell, right? Uh, and they haven't found anybody to buy it, and now they're sort of going further and further into debt because they're, they're obligated by what they agreed to to continue buying this product. Um, for something like that, that's, that's something you can absolutely contact our consumer advocacy division that Jarlinus had mentioned earlier. Uh, we can try to work with the business to help you out there. As we continue to go clockwise, uh, you'll see the, the lottery balls there. Lottery scams, one of the most common types of scam that we see out there, probably the most common of the, the scams that are trying to make you so excited that you've won something that you don't stop to think about it. Uh, the golden rule with those lottery scams is that you shouldn't have to pay money to win money, right? If you win the lottery, there are fees, taxes, whatever, right? Whatever they need to, to get from you, they can take out of your winnings before they give it to you or, or it's something you declare at the end of the year. So uh, you don't want to be having to pay money in order to get your prize. Uh, and that's true of things like you've won a free cruise, right? Well, if it's free, why do I have to pay you $5,000 before I get to go on the cruise? Uh, and, and you should never have to pay money ahead of time. Uh, right down here is you know, financial schemes, people who are looking for investors. Uh, things like that. Just want to be very careful whenever you're giving uh, a, a, a large prepayment before you see any return, right? Always doing your research about who you're giving your hard earned money to. Uh, and finally, our friend in the middle who seems very excited with whatever's going on in his computer. Hopefully, he's not the victim of a scam here, but we're seeing more and more computer scams. Uh, we really are, it's a, it's a fast growing area of complaints that are coming into our office. I think it's for a couple of reasons. One, I think every day more people are getting online, more people are getting computers. Uh, but, but I think the secondary thing to that is more people are starting to, to feel more comfortable on their computer. You know, I know when my aunts and uncles, my grandmother first got a computer, uh, my dad was known as the tech savvy one of the family. So every time something popped up on the screen, they'd call my dad to figure out what it was about, right? And they, they wouldn't do anything, they were so cautious. Uh, but as people spend longer on the computer, they get a little bit more comfortable with it. Uh, and then when something sort of out of the ordinary happens, they may not talk to somebody about it, right? And, and that leaves them sort of in a vulnerable position to potentially be scammed. So that leads us into the methods used to scam, and really they're anyway, right? Anyway someone can get into contact you, unfortunately scammers are going to try to use that to take your money. Door-to-door uh, -door scams, we'll talk about towards the end of the presentation. I put them in a slightly separate category because when you're facing someone door to door, it's a little bit different than these scammers who are halfway across the globe who are trying to steal your money. What we see with door to door scams are most often people are over promising something, under delivering, uh, things like that. Internet, I had just mentioned, is um, really a, a quickly growing one. 
Still, the number one area of complaints we get regards to scams, though, are these phone scams. I think, again, that's for two reasons. One, I do think phone scams are more common than any other type of scam. It's so easy for these scammers, you know, using these automatic dialers to make tens of thousands of calls an hour uh, all across the country. But I do also think that the phone scams are more annoying than any other type of scam as well, and I think that's part of the reason why we hear about them. You know, when you get, you will see mail down there, or you get an email that may be a scam, you can just put that aside, you can just delete that, you can shred that piece of mail and go on with your day. You know, your phone is ringing off the hook from when you wake up to when you go to bed, when you're trying to eat a meal, right, when you're trying to watch the Celtics scam. I got like two scam phone calls the other night, uh, which I did not pick up, uh, but, but it, it's a very annoying, and I, and I think that's part of the reason why we hear about it more more than those other scams and why people get sort of more worked up about you know, solutions to, to phone scams, which we'll talk about. Uh, those mail scams and the, those credit card offers, again, we just want to be very careful when anybody sends us something through the mail, we didn't ask for it, and they're asking us to put our personal information down there. You, know, you don't know, even if they say that they're MasterCard or Visa, Discover, or whatever it may be, Capital One, if they're a financial institution, you don't know when you mail that back if it's actually going to, to who they say they are. So you always want to independently verify when you get something unsolicited in the mail. And we'll talk about that when we talk about the fake check scam coming up. So mail, phone scams, email scams also work in many of these same ways too. Uh, they'll do things like they'll, they'll pose as a government or a bank, right? What's the reason why they do this? They do this because everyone interacts with the government, or most everyone interacts with the government at some level. You know, most people are interacting with one of these major banks so that when they pretend to be the government or the bank, right, there's not a lot of people who are going to see through the scam because they don't do business with that organization, right? My bank is the State Employees Credit Union, Metro Credit Union. So if I get a, an email from Bank of America to update my account, I know that it's a scam right away, right? But they don't, po they don't pretend to be a small credit union because they wouldn't get many people that way. They pretend to be Bank of America, TD Bank, uh, so that they can uh, scam you and scam more people uh, who won't just necessarily see through it out of hand. Uh, you know, they'll, they'll go on the, the, they'll use the robocalls, as I mentioned. Uh, they'll say they're their government. And, and what they'll generally do when they do these types of government type scams is they'll threaten you, right? Uh, a good example of this is the IRS scam. I'm sure we've all gotten a phone call from someone who said they were at the IRS, right? Said that we owed back taxes. How it generally works is they'll usually pick a, a really high amount that they say you owe. They'll say you owe $10,000 worth of uh, back taxes, they'll generally pick a, a year, you know, somewhat in the past, right? The thought process being, you remember last year's taxes, you probably remember two years ago pretty well, but if we say you owe these taxes from 2005, it's not at that instant recall level uh, that you have with the other, the other years. And then uh, what they'll generally do is they'll say you owe $10,000, that they're gonna send the police to your house right now to arrest you, that they're gonna drag you into court to get you to pay this, right? And then they're gonna offer you what seems like a lifeline. They're gonna say you owe $10,000, but if you send us $3,000 right now, we'll take care of it, right? And the thought process behind that is that they're hoping you're so worked up, you're so nervous that you don't send, uh, you don't think about it and you just send the money, right? Because they're hoping you don't think, uh, you, you don't question if the IRS would ever just call you out of the blue, which they wouldn't, right? If there was an issue with your taxes, it would start with the letter. They're hoping you don't think, well, I trust my accountant or I know I did my taxes correctly. You know, I, I, I know that, that I did that well. And they're hoping you don't get to that point. Or they're hoping, and, and perhaps this is just my case, you think, well, there's no way I possibly made enough money in that year to owe $10,000 worth of taxes, right? They're hoping you don't get to that critical level of thinking because you'll just go with it right away. One thing is true of almost all scams, when they ask for that payment, what they're gonna do is they're gonna ask for it in some sort of untraceable form of payment, right? They're not gonna say, oh, write us a check or you know, grab some cash uh, from your bank and meet us at this place, right? They don't wanna have any interaction with you. They don't want any way for it to, to be traced to them. So what they'll do is they'll, they'll have you send it through a wire transfer, right? Go to a Western Union, send a wire transfer. Uh, get a MoneyGram or a Green Dot card, something, some sort of reloadable debit card, and, and send them uh, that at a CVS or wherever they have it. One of the big ones that we see now is they'll have you buy like an iTunes gift card. They'll say, put the money on an iTunes gift card. Over the phone, you'll read the numbers off the card to them, and they'll take the money like that, right? And again, what they're hoping is you don't stop and think, well, 
is the federal government really going to accept payment in an iTunes gift card? Right? They, they don't want you to get to that point of it. Uh, they just want you to, to send them the money. And with all these scams, what you'll see is that the little details are the things that they can control. So these scammers, they have a technique. It's called spoofing. And so they can make any phone number that they want appear on your telephone when they call you. So oftentimes, what you'll see is they'll try to make it a local number so you're more likely to pick up. I think the one I've noticed most recently is almost all the scam calls that I'm getting have my area code and then my my exchange, and then the last four numbers are the only four numbers that are different. Sometimes they'll even have your own phone number show up on your caller ID. I don't know if anyone's seen that one before. But again, they just want you to think, well, that, that's so weird, right, that, I, that I'm going to pick up the phone for this. That's so strange. Uh, because what they know is that if you don't pick up the phone, they have a 0% chance of scamming you. You can't be scammed if you're not interacting with them. If you pick up the phone, they have a slight chance, even if it's something you think you're going to see through right away. So they'll go, they'll go out of their way to try to make you pick up the phone. In the IRS scam example, what that spoofing does, they'll have the IRS's phone number, or at the very least, a, a Washington, D.C. area code 202 number as the number that comes up, right? That will lend a little bit of credence to what they're saying. They may know your name, right? They may know your address. They may even have some more information about you uh, if, if they got it through as something like a data breach, right? Uh, it's important not to read in too much to that and really just focus on, on the essence of what they're trying to, to sell you, which is that you owe these back taxes, they're threatening you about them, and they want you to send them the money via some, some form of untraceable uh, money transfer and not get it sort of lost in the details there. Other things we'll, we have here, you know, debt consolidation, just want to be very careful if you're dealing with someone or you know of someone who's having debt problems and they're, they're thinking about going to one of these debt consolidation businesses that they saw uh, on TV, an ad, or they saw online, right? We have, you know, unfortunately had people call the office who, let's say they're in $15,000 worth of credit card debt. And they go to one of these debt consolidators. They say, for $5,000, you know, we'll take care of all your debt. Well, what happens to that person is now they're in $20,000 worth of debt because they gave $5,000 up front to this you know, unscrupulous business, scrupulous business uh, that then did nothing for them uh, and unfortunately left them more in debt. Complaints like that, of course, can come to the Attorney General's office, our car division, well, we can try to help you out. They'll also try to confirm your personal info, right? Well, we said these with the phishing scams, a lot of times they'll have you put it in yourself. Uh, but we also see things where they'll, they'll call you, they'll say, you know, they're Comcast, right? They're Comcast, there's a problem with your account. Uh, we just need to make sure it's you first, so can you give us your social security number, right? Again, they're acting like they have it, but they don't have it. They're trying to get that information from you. We also hear of, uh, uh, on the news and, and in other reports, you'll see uh, the, the fear that they're, what they're trying to do is get you to say yes on the phone, right? They're trying to get you to say yes to some question because then they'll record that yes. They'll call into some other you know, banking institution or whatever it may be, and they'll use your recorded yes as proof that it's you coming, you know, going over the phone. I'm not saying that doesn't happen. I'm sure you know, that does happen, and that's why we uh, suggest more than anything else that you just not interact with these scammers at all, right? If it's a phone number you don't recognize and you have a, an answering machine, you have a voicemail, all right? you have some sort of service that someone can leave a message on, if you don't recognize the number, don't pick it up, right? If it's someone who actually wants to interact with you, the hope is that they'll leave a message. Uh, you know, so be, to be careful about that, but also to know, you know, with many of these scammers, they're looking for the path of sort of least, least resistance, right? These are, you know, hundreds of people in big rooms making thousands of calls a day. So when you start to put up some resistance, right, whether it's blocking a phone number they're calling from, whether it's not picking up their call, even if they, they call three times, right, they tend to, they tend to leave your number alone more. Um, now, now, of course, we also get a lot of scam calls because there are, unfortunately, a lot of these people out there. But uh, when we start putting up some resistance to these scammers and we, we don't sort of play into what they're trying to sell us, uh, they, often, they often move on to another target. So the, the other side of the coin, right, are, are these scams where they're trying to, they say you've won money, right? The, the IRS is you owe money. Uh, what we see with the fake check scam is, a, is really unfortunate. Uh, it often starts as a mail scam. So you get something in the mail. It could be from the lottery. It could be from a law firm. 
right, saying you're some part of some class action settlement. We've even seen some instances where they say it's from the Attorney General's office, and you know, we reached, the Attorney General's office reached a settlement with this business, you were affected, here's the money we're paying you out. However, however it starts, however it comes to you, it's always gonna end up the same way, which is they're gonna give you that check, they're gonna have you deposit that check into your account and send them some portion of it back, right? So let's say it's a $5,000 check. They're usually gonna ask for some small amount, $250, $500 of the 5,000 they just gave you, sent back to them, again, through those Western Union MoneyGram untraceable form of payment. So when you bring that check in, you know, within a couple days, the bank is gonna make the funds available to you. It's gonna look like the check has cleared, so you'll be able to take out the money and send it to the person who sent you the check. However, Within about a week or so, when the bank actually gets to the end of the check, what they're going to find is that you know, there was a bad check. There was no funds behind it. The check is going to bounce. So where does that leave you? Well, you didn't win the money that you thought you had won. You're out the money that you sent them because it didn't actually come from this check that you put it in. It came from your actual account. We see instances where, unfortunately, this puts people below a, a zero balance in their account. It's an account they don't use that often. It was a pretty high amount of money, right? So now when they need to pay bills, they need to go to the grocery store, whatever they need to do, they don't have any money in their account. And uh, you know, unfortunately, sometimes there are fees and other charges that, that the bank tax on when your account goes below zero. And sometimes even if your account doesn't go below zero, what the bank will do is freeze your account temporarily because from their perspective, what happened is you tried to pass a bad check you put that check in there, then you immediately took out some form of money, and they don't know that you then you know, sent it to a scammer, right? From their perspective, it, it could have been that you tried to get money from that bad check. Um, <clears throat> now, banks are aware that the fake check scam is a thing, and in you know, the calls that have come to our office, they're almost always willing to work with someone to make sure that they can get their account unfrozen, and in many instances, actually try to talk to somebody before they do something like take all the money out of their account to send on be, uh, because of this fake check scam. Uh, but still, in the moment, if your account gets frozen and you need to make a purchase, obviously, that's not a good thing. The best way to, to protect yourself from these fake check scams, again, is the idea that you shouldn't have to pay money to win money. If it's the lottery and they need to take out fees, they can take it out before they give it to you. Right? If we think of it as this class action settlement that you are a part of, well, I don't know any law firm that's going to win this big class action settlement, send out all the money that they want to consumers, and then hope that they send it back to the law firm so that the law firm actually gets some money in here. Right? And if it comes from the attorney general's office, what we'll often, you know, that our office works so specifically to make sure that everybody's getting the exact amount that they're entitled to in this settlement that you know, it would never be a situation where that money would have to be sent back to us. Uh, the other big thing is to independently verify a phone number, uh, a, a place to reach this organization that, that, that has sent you this check. Oftentimes the check will come enclosed, a letter will be enclosed with the check. That'll have a phone number on it that you can call, you know, if you want to check the veracity of the check or whatever it may be. You know, that phone number is also part of the scam. So it's important not to just call that phone number that came with the check, but to actually look up a phone number for the organization that says it's sending you this check, if it's the lottery or a law firm, whatever it may be. Again, remembering that you know, these scammers can make an envelope look real. They can get the actual address of who they say is sending this to you. They can make a check look real. That's, that's not the hard part for them. What they have to overcome is the idea that you have to pay money to win this money, right? And, that, and that's never going to be the case. So uh, you know, keep that in mind. But even if they don't ask for money back right away, sometimes they'll ask for it at a later date and they'll, to, to make you more likely to deposit the check. Uh, always independently verify when anybody's sending you something like a check through the mail. Right? When we get a call into our office that says, oh, the Attorney General's office just sent me a check for in regards to X settlement, right? Well, we can look it up right away to determine and make sure that it's actually correct. Uh, hopefully we get to tell people that, yes, you, that is actually your money. You know, we don't like it as much when we have to say, oh no, I'm sorry, that's a scam. But either way, that person did the right thing uh, and, and independently verified that information. The other thing we have up here, uh, and we like to make mention to it, because what I've, what I've spoken about so far are mostly these wide net scams, right? When we're talking about why are they the government, why are they these big banks? Well, because it affects everybody. They don't want to put a lot of research into it. Sometimes scammers do, and, and one of the scams where we see that is what's called the grandparent scam. So these scammers can go on Facebook or whatever it may be, and they can find out that you or someone you know has a relative. Uh, a grandchild, a niece or nephew, and let's say that they go to college at Florida State, right? So how this scam works is you get a, you get a call 
from a police department that says, you know, your grandchild, your niece, your nephew, your relative, whomever, has, has been, got into some trouble and they need you to pay money right now to bail them out of jail, right? Let's say they go to Florida State, when they call you, they'll say they're the Tallahassee Police Department, right? Let's say they go to UMass, when they call, they'll say they're the Amherst Police Department, right? So they, they can do that, that level of research, right? But what's really gonna be a key for a scam like this is that they're then gonna ask you to send them bail and iTunes gift cards, right? Something that, that's never actually going to be the case. So I really hate this scam because I can see, of course, it's so difficult to take a step back when someone is saying, your relative needs your help right now, can you send us some money, right? But again, it, it is important when people are having you send that money and it's not actually your relative who's calling you, right? It's someone who says they're with the police or uh, another organization there, that we do a little bit of research. We try to reach our relative. We try to reach their parents, right? Someone else who knows them. Uh, we think, are they actually in this location right now? Because sometimes they'll just pick you know, some far-flung police department and you have no way of knowing whether or not your relative is there, but it might seem a little bit weird to you. Uh, and specifically to know, you know, sending this through iTunes, Walmart gift cards, uh, a, a wire transfer, right? Why, why do I have to use this untraceable form of payment, right? Why can't I use another one? And, and they'll push back on that because it is gonna be a scam. And we talk about, we talk a lot about the things that are free, right? We shouldn't have to pay money to win money. Uh, specifically with the free trial, because it's a little bit different. Oftentimes when you sign up for a free trial of some sort of health or beauty product, whatever it may be, uh, the first one will come to you, will actually be free, right? It's, let's say some sort of cream, and you'll use about 5% of it in the first month that you have it, and then the next month another one comes, and with that one comes an $80 charge for this product, right? And you've somehow unknowingly signed up for this recurring charge. Uh, if something like that comes up, you can absolutely contact the Attorney General's office. We can contact that business on your behalf and, and try to get that issue resolved. Uh, but just be very careful when you're signing up for something free, right? You'll sign up for something free. Let's say you do it online. They'll have something pop up that's some terms of service agreement, right? It's 70 pages long. Nobody reads the whole thing. But buried within there might be you agreeing to this recurring charge. But we can try to work on that with you. Uh, some more example of internet scams that we're seeing. We see, unfortunately, a, a large number on social networks. On Facebook, someone will add you, someone you don't know, uh, and, and be your friend. Sometimes these are uh, romantic relationships that they're saying. Sometimes they're just friendships, but uh, you'll talk to them for months and then they'll want to come visit you, right? They'll say, oh, I, I, I'd love to come to Boston, come to Stowe, wherever you may be. Uh, I'd love to come visit you, but I just don't have the money for a plane ticket. Can you send me $600? I'll get a plane ticket and, and we can spend some time in person. So you send them the money and then wouldn't you know something catastrophic happened? You sent them the money, they're supposed to get on the flight on Saturday and their sister was in a car accident. No way they could have made it to the airport, right? And so they'll say, I'm so sorry, but can you send me the money again? I'll, I'll definitely come this time. And then, you know, this time they ended up in the emergency room when they're supposed to be taking this flight. Um, and, and it keeps going on and on like that. One, one thing we really like to say with this one is if you have sort of any inkling that this may be happening to somebody you know, a relative, a friend, to talk to them about it. I think there's really a deep shame that comes with being scammed. I think especially in these instances where they think that they know someone, they think they're friends with this person, and this person is actually just out to get them. So rather than you know, using logical thinking, these people really cling on to the belief that, that this is a real person who actually does want to come visit. Uh, and many times, someone else speaking to them about it can kind of get them out of this cycle uh, and get them to stop sending money to, the, to that person. Um, because oftentimes they won't reach out to an organization like ours or, or anybody else. They just won't want to talk about it. Classifieds, I mean, of course, if you're buying something online from a Craigslist, you want to be careful about sending the whole payment ahead of time, uh, making sure that you're actually going to get what you think you're getting. But we also like to, you know, to be wary when you're selling something or renting. Let's say you're subletting a room in your house. You want, a, you want first and last month's rent. Uh, from the person who's going to sublet, let's say it's $600 a month, so you're expecting $1,200 to come from this person. They send you a check for $2,400. They'll say, oh, I'm sorry, I read it wrong. I thought you wanted the first four months rent. Uh, can you just cash this check and then give me $1,200 back rather than me writing a new one? And that's another way that the fake check scam gets started, right? They, they've actually sent you a bad check. So you want to be very careful uh, when you, with all those online purchases, especially if someone's asking you to send some portion of a check back to you. 
Uh, and we can go to the next one because um, we, we covered most of this. With the door-to-door -door scams, like I said, uh, a lot of times what we see here is sort of over-promising what people will actually do when they come to your door uh, or under-delivering at the end. When we're speaking about home improvement, <coughs> right, uh, one thing we like to make clear is, you know, to get a written contract when someone is doing some sort of work to your house, you have that right to get that written contract. They may try to pressure you into just a verbal agreement. Oh, I can get started so much faster if you didn't make me write up this contract, right? I can get started this afternoon, but you, know, you, you want me to write up everything I'm gonna do. It's important to have that written contract because if something does go wrong during the process, you want that to, to look back to. You don't want just your word against their word. Uh, if it were to be brought to the Office of Consumer Affairs who oversees contractors or it ends up in small claims court, right, having that written contract is important. The other thing is within that written contract should be your three-day right to cancel. In all door-to-door -door sales in Massachusetts, you do have that three-day right to cancel so that you know, if somebody comes to your house and they're pressuring you and they're in your house or they're on your property and you just want them to leave so you agree to more than you wanted or agree to something you didn't want at all, uh, you know, get that written contract. You have that three-day right to cancel. How you cancel your contract, the steps you have to take are going to be written out in the, in the written contract within the three days, uh, just to have that information in case, you know, you do agree to something uh, you didn't want just to get that person to leave or you just decide the next day that, you know, you didn't actually, didn't actually want to do that. Uh, you didn't go to them. They came to you. So you have that, that three-day right to cancel. With charities, uh, you know, just to be aware of, of when someone's coming door to door collecting for charities, there are, there are organizations, there are services you can use to check how much of the money actually goes to charity. Is there, this a registered charity? M almost all charities who operate in Massachusetts have to register with the Attorney General's office. So you can also give us a call or go on our website to see if this is actually a registered charity. Uh, specifically, I'll say, most of the charity scams that we see are for local organizations. They'll say they're collecting for the local police fund or the local firefighters, right? The thought process being who wouldn't want to give to you know, the local public servants protecting them. Uh, but oftentimes, the, no, I, won't, I don't want to say oftentimes, many times those will be scams. So you just want to be very careful uh, when you're giving money that it's actually going to, to who you think it's going. Things like newspaper subscriptions or really anything that's being sold door to door, just to be aware of how much are you paying up front for this and, and you know, before you actually see have, uh, any delivery of what they're promising to give you. So information on where to report some of these scams. Uh, of course, at the Attorney General's office, we're happy to hear about the latest scams. It's helpful to us when we do presentations like this that we can actually know what's going on with, with folks, right? We actually know what the com most common scams are right now so we don't go on and on and on about scams that were happening two years ago but aren't happening anymore. Uh, in terms of investigation of the people perpetrating these scams, though, because they're almost never in Massachusetts, they're rarely in the United States, although some are. Uh, we, su we suggest that you report these to the federal agency that's going to oversee them. So for telephone scams, it's the Federal Trade Commission. For mail scams, it's the investigative arm of the Postal Service, which is the U.S. Postal Inspection Service. Uh, and for internet scams, it's a website. It's IC3, the letter I, the letter C, the numeral 3, .gov. It stands for the Internet Crime Complaint Center, uh, which is run partially by the FBI. So with that, we just want to move quickly uh, and make sure we have enough time to talk about identity theft. One analogy we use to begin with with identity theft is that it's a lot like getting sick uh, it, it, for the reasons that we've listed there, but also because you, know, you can do a lot to protect yourself from getting sick, right? You can not go outside with a wet head of hair. You can you know, not be around people who are sick. You can take these common sense measures. But unless you want to live by yourself in a very clean room, right, occasionally you do get sick. Sometimes a virus does find its way to you. The same is true of identity theft. You can take the common sense measures, not give out your personal information, you know, only use your social security number, write it down when absolutely necessary. Uh, but there are still things like the Equifax data breach, right? The Equifax data breach, Equifax is a credit reporting agency that you probably didn't you know, contract to do business with. You may have pulled a credit report from them, but they had your personal information. You didn't give it to them. And it wasn't protected, right? Half of the country, uh, almost three million people in Massachusetts, may have had their information compromised by this Equifax data breach. So even if you did everything perfectly, your information still could have gotten out there from the Equifax data breach. So. In many ways, that's sort of scary to think about, right? This idea that you know, we can be perfect and we can still be the victims of identity theft. But I also think we can choose to look at 
as sort of a, a teaching, as an instructive uh, notion, and realize that nobody is above identity theft. Nobody is doing it so well that there's no way their identity can be stolen. And so we all need to know the steps to take to protect ourselves. <clears throat> so this is just some of the ways you may notice that you're the victim of identity theft. A bank transaction you don't recognize. You get calls or letters from a debt collector. Uh, that may be a scam, but it could also be a sign of, of identity theft. You'll notice it on your credit report, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Someone may file taxes in your name. Uh, we're seeing that sort of more and more lately, where you go to file your taxes with either the IRS or the Department of Revenue. They say you already filed your taxes and they already sent your refund out there. Uh, that means you're the victim of identity theft, or you may see bills coming in the mail. So, so what do you do to begin with if you think you're the victim of identity theft? The first thing is to fill out an identity theft complaint form or affidavit. That's with the Federal Trade Commission. You can do it online. The, the, the address is identitytheft.gov. Pretty easy to remember. You can also file a local police report uh, that you are the victim of this crime. And together, they create your ID theft report. From there, you can call your credit reporting bureaus. You can also do this before you, you file either of those uh, documents. And, and in many ways, I think you should. Uh, you get one free credit report a year from each of the three major credit reporting agencies, so Equifax, Experian, and TransUnion. If you space them out, you can check your credit every four months, free of charge, without affecting your credit. In today's day and age, since so much information has been breached, so much information has been hacked, I would really suggest that, that people get in the habit of checking their credit reports every four months if they haven't. The other things you could, oh, can you go back? The other things you can do, if you think you're the victim, or even if you, you don't think you're the victim, you can place a fraud alert on your credit report. A fraud alert is what it sounds like. It's an alert that goes on your credit report. I believe when you place it, it stays for 90 days. And if someone pulls your credit, right, someone does a hard pull of your credit, looks at your whole report to approve you for a loan, they'll see that that fraud alert is on there, and they should take extra steps to make sure that it's actually you who's applying for this credit. The other thing you can place is a security freeze. A security freeze stops any hard inquiry into your credit. So anytime a creditor wants to pull your credit to determine if you're worthy for this loan, this mortgage, this new credit card, whatever it may be, they're not going to be able to. They're, so it's absolutely the best way to protect yourself from identity theft. A couple of things to be aware of there. Uh, for now, and there's a bill that's passed both houses in, in the state house. I believe it just has to be put together and signed by the governor. But for now, it costs $5 to place a security freeze. It also costs $5 to what's called thaw your credit, which is lifting the security freeze. And that's with each of the credit reporting agencies, so it's, it's really $15 to place. Hopefully with this new bill, when it gets signed, it will be free, uh, which will take away that concern. But the other thing to be aware of with security freeze is that you know, while it does stop any identity thief from taking your information, it also stops you, right? So if you need to apply for a new credit card or you want to refinance your mortgage or you need a new auto loan or whatever it may be, you're not going to be able to do that either. And you're going to have to thaw your credit before, uh, before they can check that. It's just something to be aware of. If you feel you're the victim of identity theft, you also want to alert all your creditors, right? Your credit cards, bank accounts, investment accounts. It's possible they just got something like your social security number, and with that, all they can really do is open a new line of credit. But it's also possible they got more information about you. They got your credit card information, right? So they can run up, uh, they can run up a lot of money on a credit card or deplete your bank accounts. Uh, and a security freeze is not going to protect you from something like that, right? That's a line of credit that you already have. Uh, so you want to alert all your creditors, and that's where filling out that ID theft report will make it easier if you have to go to your bank and need to change an account number or something like that. So again, just uh, a quick overview. You can create that report. Uh, I, may, I may even sort of switch the order here if you don't know that you're the victim of identity theft. You know, call your credit reporting bureaus, figure that out, see, what, see what's on there, and then to call your creditors as well. If your Social Security number is compromised, I haven't heard of the Social Security Administration really doing anything for anyone. I don't, I don't know if uh, there are stories where they, they have uh, helped people out, but you can certainly let them know that you believe your uh, number has been compromised. For the tax fraud, again, state taxes, that's the Department of Revenue. If there's an issue with your state taxes, federal taxes, that's the Internal Revenue Service, the IRS. Uh, and you're going to want to get that cleared up um, if you didn't actually file your taxes. You can go to the next one. And this is just some general online tips that we have as well uh, to protect yourself, right? Have an antivirus on there. 
when you know who you're dealing with, right? Independently verify if anyone's asking for your personal information, especially if you didn't begin the conversation. Uh, be careful about how much information you're releasing. Uh, and, and, you know, create strong passwords. Something to be aware of with that. We're seeing uh, things on Facebook. There are like these, these quizzes on Facebook and other social networking sites where they're asking you questions like, what was the first car you had? You know, what was the name of your first pet? And it's like, compared to how everybody else's first car or name, right? Sometimes those are, are used by scammers then because they're the most common security questions when you've forgotten something like your password. So to be very careful about even something that seems innocuous, right? Like, who was my first grade teacher, right? Scammers may try to take that information and, and to steal your identity, steal your money later on. So we have this number up here. If you're having an issue with identity theft, if you're having an issue with scams, that's the number for our Consumer Advocacy and Response Division. Uh, there are experts there. They can help you out. They can talk through you know, all the steps we talked through today in a little bit more detail, give you exact numbers, exact uh, internet URL addresses. Uh, the other thing I want to mention that we also is on your paper there, we do have an elder hotline as well. If you uh, have a relative or, or someone else who's going to need a little bit more time to talk these things through, maybe the victim of a scam, uh, and, and really need some time to speak with somebody about it, I'd suggest calling our elder hotline. This hotline gets hundreds of calls a day, and we do our best to, to help everybody, but you know, by, by nature moves a little bit quicker on our elder hotline. You know, if it takes 20, 30 minutes to, to work through this with someone, they have the time to do that. And then all these are, are on your uh, forms, uh, your, the handouts we gave as well, um, but the, some of the divisions that John had mentioned at the beginning. And with that, so that's all we have. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. We can also just stick around afterwards, but thanks so much for having us again. I hope this information was helpful.